I'm an evolutionary psychologist, which is a psychologist, a research psychologist that looks at human behavior and non-human behavior from an evolutionary perspective. Why are certain behaviors seem to be ubiquitous ac across humankind? And also, um, there are behaviors among other non-human animals that sometimes seem a lot like ours. And I find that really fascinating, especially because it's a way of uniting all people and a way of uniting us with the other living things on this planet. And that to me is something special. One of the things I often hear, is, in fact, uh, we, we get this uh, quite a bit. I know Richard Dawkins has gotten this comment made of, I'm, you know, I'm not an animal, I'm not just an animal. Well, I'm sorry, actually we are animals. We are definitely animals. And the Richard Dawkins Foundation has this wonderful t-shirt and it, on the front, it says, we are all Africans. And it's true, we all descended from a small tribe in Africa, uh, in, uh, in and around the Kenya. And to think of that little tiny struggling group being able to not only survive, but then to extend across the planet, how much better than the Adam and Eve story is this, this march out of, out of Africa and down into Southern Africa of these, this little group of what are now uh, Homo sapiens sapiens. And it's, it's a lovely story. And every child can learn it uh, just as easily as they learn the biblical stories. So why not sit down and read a child the story of, of the migration out of Africa? Listening to other scientists go up and speak, I'm, I think, oh, I've got to go read that. I've got to go look that up. That's wonderful. That's really neat. That would apply to this. And you, may, you start making all these connections. And that's what you want children to do. Children start out as little scientists. What do babies do when they're sitting in their high chair? They, they'll throw stuff off and then watch what mom or dad does, right? They're what their caretaker does. And then, of course, they go over and pick it up, and they're, they're delighted, and then they do it again. Well, they're also testing gravity. Oh, wow, it always falls down. It always falls down. And you can, you, and, and even smaller infants, watch how they, they watch your mouth form words, and they will, they're doing it. We have what are called mirror neurons that uh, if, for example, I had you hooked up, you're, and we're looking at, at your brain waves, and you were watching me squeeze a tube of toothpaste onto a toothbrush, even though you didn't move, your muscles are actually reacting and your brain's reacting as if you're making the same move as I am. Now this is how animals often learn how to do something, and it's true with, with humans. An infant, next time you're around a really small infant, watch how they watch people. I, I once saw an infant beside her mother, she was on the treadmill, and I could see the baby, you know, attempting to try to mimic, and her little legs were, you know, sort of moving because mom's legs were moving. And this is how we children learn eventually how to walk. They're already training those muscles and they're getting that, the mind and the muscles to respond. And is, I mean, isn't that really fun? And so babies start out of these little scientists constantly testing the world, constantly testing what they can do and how far they can push their parents as psychological experiments. And, <laughs> you know, and then somehow we send them off to school and we kill that little scientist within them. We, I always think the worst thing we can do is put a kid in a science classroom with a bunch of Bunsen burners and try to say this is what science is. It's not, that's not what science is. Science class to really intrigue children in science is to go in and, and like Bill Nye the science guy and really talk about the beauty of science. When children are denied learning about evolution, about the universe, about the Big Bang, that all of those stories are so amazingly beautiful. 
And to, to be with a child and explore that, even when they're young, they're not going to get the whole full effect of evolution, but they're certainly, it's going to be with them and it's going to stay there and they're going to ask more questions. And going to a zoo with a child and talking to the child about uh, well, this is why this animal looks this way, and you can tell by the the way the male is larger and the female is smaller that they probably their mating system is probably a harem rather than monogamous mating. And you can make it so it's understood by a child, and you can talk about these things: how domestication happened, why why dogs are so loyal to us. All of these these things can be discussed with a child, and as they grow up, having this basis in science. Um, they'll have a much fuller understanding of the world.